Good evening and welcome to Bull History Team's August meeting. Uh, being in a COVID situation, we have restricted the numbers tonight to 28. But we do welcome you to hear and we look forward to hearing from David Pitt, who will enlighten us on the history of Gawler Primary School. I went to Gawler Primary School 70 years ago and my wife Beverly taught at Gawler Primary School 50 years ago. So with that I look forward to David's address and we welcome you David and uh, please come forward and give it to us. Thank you very much. Firstly, thank you, Brian, and thank you to everyone here who's here tonight and invited me to talk about the history of Gawler Primary School. I'm actually here tonight because I um, met Brian at our 140th birthday celebrations, and Brian on that night came up to me and said, would you be interested in talking about Gawler Primary School in 2020 at our history meeting? I thought, that's a long way away, but nothing to worry about, and for a new 2020 was here, and I thought it's around the corner, so I thought I'd better get myself organised and and come and present to you people tonight. So um, I'm hoping, is there many ex-scholars in the audience tonight? <coughs> all right, if you are, don't give me a quiz afterwards at all, but I hope there's anything that you need to correct me about or check it out with me, let me know afterwards. But um, I know the school has a very rich history and heritage, and I hope I do justice to tonight's presentation for it. A little bit about me, I've been there since 2014 as a, as a primary school principal and actually Gore Primary School was my first principal appointment. So when I do leave the school one day, I will look back fondly as being my first ever principal appointment and working with a wonderful community, its rich history and heritage and what I think is a great community spirit which has come through over the past 142 years. And having worked in metropolitan schools and country schools, I have to say that the resources and facilities of the school are outstanding and I think right from the very beginning when it was designed and lo looked upon for where they're going to locate a school, um, it stands out very much so in this town. So looking forward to sharing that with you um, tonight. So on this first slide here, just a PowerPoint here, this is a picture I'm looking for from Nixon Terrace of the school there. So obviously they haven't built the car park there in, back in 1923, but that's just a um, side of the school there and down, I'm sure the torch is working properly here, that there may be referred to for me as called the Old Canteen, which is now our breakfast club. Um, so certainly that's a uh, resource that's used every day there, but uh, yeah, that's looking off from Nixon Terrace back many years ago. Right. All good? All right. So how did Gawler Primary School come about? Well, back in 1875, the Education Act paved the way for government-funded primary schools and free compulsory education in South Australia. Gawler Primary School's beginning can be traced back to actually eight, February 8, 1876, when it was announced a model school would be built in Gawler. Later in, in December of that year, the tender of Mr Tardiff for the new school building was accepted at a cost of £4,695 um, shillings and pence. These materials used locally were from bluestone in the Gawler South Quarries and the materials are still there in that original stone building. The design of the original heritage building is actually quite unique with the steep gables, got the tall belfry in there and actually an intricate air circulation system with a prominent roof fence. Um, unfortunately the box gutter design up there hasn't been the best thing for our pigeon friends. Um, which has caused many problems. However, um, having got up there and had looked around in there, it's quite a unique design up in there. And just on that bell, I remember a student only just recently decided to ring it a couple of years ago, and no one had any idea of how to turn it off. So coming back from um, getting a nice phone call to say, how do you turn this bell off? Even I didn't know what needed to be done for that. So on April 12, 1877, the foundation stone of the school was laid by the then Mayor, the Honourable James Martin. And by 24th of January 1878, Gawler Primary School was actually officially opened with the Minister of Education then, Sir Arthur Blythe, 
and the President of the Council of Education, Mr. J. A. Hartley. By the time that Gawler Primary School was actually built, many people thought that um, Gawler Primary was actually the first school there, and actually it was the first government school at the time, because Gawler was already 30 to 40 years old, and there was already records showing that there was uh, a school had been built on Sh Shotner Terrace in 1848, and that St. George's School Room had been built and used in 1850. So, Yes, it's one of the first model schools in the state and first government schools, but there are already a number of schools in the area at the time. Okay. On this PowerPoint slide here, up the top left-hand corner, we've got a picture of the old principal's residence. Now, I don't have anything like that today, I don't. Um, and I believe that would be in the corner of Porter Street there, it looks like, I think, and Nixon Terrace, I think, at the time. So um, that was sadly demolished back almost 1971, almost 50 odd years ago, but um, obviously talked about by a lot of people who went to the school and you know, had visited in the principal's house at the time. They don't build principal's houses anymore today, so not a thing of the current history in schools, but certainly um, that was a prominent building um, in the school's history there. And over there we have the class of grade 4 in 1911, um, sitting out there on the western side of the Heritage Building there. I don't know if, um, when we look at the clips later on, there might be some names that people recall there, um, but it's going back well over almost 110 years ago there, of the time. So the first headmaster of the school was a Mr. Ellis Burton, who, who previously had been working at St George's Day School. Um, unfortunately, though, Mr. Burton didn't stay long ago at the primary school. He resigned two and a half years later, with claims that he was unhappy being away from St. George's. So, a very short bit of time there. And his replacement was the Mr. I. A. Plummer of the time. Um, and in 1881, obviously, we, there's a photo shown here and there for it, um, that a land fronting on Porter Street was purchased for that two story principal's residence. As we turn into the 1900s, in 1907, the public school added a continuation class. So this is where people would start uh, public high school education. Um, but in 1909, the school was named a district high school, but that ceased in 1915 when the Gawler High School opened up on Lindock Road. With the ever-increasing enrolments of Gawler Primary School, we created a real area for shortage. Um, in 1911, there was a reconstruction of the school that occurred, and it's worth noticing that um, when there was inspection done of the school in, on the October 17th of 1911, um, and the head of the time of the school, Mr. Jones, he was not in his best apparently due to crippling rheumatism arthritis. Um, and unfortunately, the only thing I'd be able to talk about that I wouldn't be in my best in performance meeting today with rheumatism, I'd be told to get yourself right and come back to work. Um, so yes, yeah, so certainly back in, in that time of the, of the day, um, ill health did affect staff members, uh, made things very hard. Um, for continuation with that. And in fact, in 1913, uh, Miss Edwards' class had a class of 121 students <laughs> due to the shortage of staff um, from illness. So um, with our government criteria with how many kids we can have in the class, we wouldn't get away with that today at all. We couldn't have 30 would be our maximum in the classroom today. So 121, I think many teachers would be glad that's not occurring today. Um, Okay, so this is another photo there of, of the school from Nixon Terrace there. Now, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously there was um, no road built up there just yet um, for Parnell Street. And obviously people could enter the school through um, those um, gates and fence there. And obviously there hadn't been any of the development of the landscaping on the side here. No courts as we see today. Um, play area is very limited. Um, but obviously the grand building standing there um, was quite unique um, to the school and the community there. The early 1920s saw Gawler Primary School continue to perform very well. Um, in 1921, the Minister for Education and the Director of Education actually visited the school and were pleased with what they saw, granting the children a half-day holiday. Now, unfortunately, when they get half-day holidays these days, I'm sure our students wouldn't say no to that either, as well. At the annual prize-giving meeting on December the 22nd, the special prize for the boy who had shown the most progress in development which was selected by a group of teachers and presented by the chairman of the school was the Reverend Willard Bevan, and it went to his own son, Llewellyn Bevan. 
I'm pretty sure that type of behaviour wouldn't be accepted in today's education system, um, but it shows obviously with the close-knit community um, and with, I suppose, people, how people performed and expectations on things, that um, giving awards out to a son or the ribbon was seen okay back then, but certainly not today. We would not be able to do that. It'd be based on criteria, fairness, equity, and what people have performed. And I suppose maybe you could blame it on the heat back then because um, in 1923 there was a record temperature day in one classroom, not outside but in the classroom, of 103 degrees Fahrenheit, so almost 40 degrees. So um, today we are very fortunate with cooling systems, heating systems, um, that we wouldn't be able to stop our kids coming to school for that. When we began the 1930s, this is just a photo of the 1935 Premiership team there. Don't know if any, the names of Les Ross, Colin Martin, Gordon Alden, Ted Wilkins and Rex Yates up there. Fred Brooks, Gordon Jacobs, Harry Smith, Ross Davis and Clyde Mulligan. And then there was Norm Kinsall, Kinsall, Kinsall sorry. Rich Deuter, Lloyd Weaver, Frank Lieberg, Harvey Higgins, Max Hur, sorry, right, and Les Adams. I know those names ring a bell here at all. Fred Brooks is still alive. Still alive, is he? How old is he now? Ninety seven, I think. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. So they were the premiers in nineteen thirty five there with the football. So we started the 19, 1932 with the school having 472 students and it seems that all types of students were trying to attend the school back then. Um, one female student actually brought her little sister to class one day and was told that she was seen as too little and young to be at school even though she was enthusiastic for that. A bit like at the moment with our COVID epidemic, there was a massive crisis with illness and medical issues. Um, it was noted and made sure that measles was rampant through the school um, in the 1930s, with 189 cases in October 1933, reported since August of that year. So if you think we're doing counts every day for COVID, imagine doing counts for that every day, adding that up um, for our people as we worked along. And by 1937, the 17th of December, the school had to shut for six weeks due to infantile paralysis. And that made the school open six weeks later, the following year, to as the recovery of those who were sick with that. So certainly that era of time um, had impact on student attendance, staff attendance, um, shutting the school, opening the school a bit later in the start of the following year, and surely an impact on students' learning uh, was impacted significantly missing chunks of school there. So there's our grade three class. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any names for the photo here, but that's in 1948. Anyone remember a teacher who might have been there in 1948 with year three classroom at all? Well, I was in that class. Just mm. <laughs> okay. Can you point out to where you were? <laughs> I'm at the back. Yeah, so if you look at that class size there, a quick look, that's like not a normal class size today, but the number of pupils in there at all. So. Very much so, um, looking um, from that class there. Um, yeah, we wouldn't be allowed to have a class that big today in there. Down the corner there, this is looking out onto the Nixon Terrace and Timmy out there, and that's looking across what I believe looks like where the Greyhound track is today. And that there, I'm not quite sure if that's like a, a lineage of sheds there or a. Yeah, um, that was the TAB. TAB back then. Yeah. Yep, so there it is, that's looking out there, obviously looks very different to um, how it is envisaged in today's grand detail, but again, this building is standing out there as a glorious um, of the history of the school there. And in 1941, I don't know if that, but Miss Rogers retired from teaching at the end of that year, was uh, very much sadly missed by the school community um, for her impact uh, throughout the time. One of the things that was greatly acknowledged with our school and it's been very notable when I've been here was that during the wartime the school was very much noted by how it involved the community, supported those in need um, and making sure that everyone was not just safe physically but also emotionally. And with the gaining traction, um, the Air Raid Precautions Committee under the control of Mr Corton dug three trenches, one on the Blaketon Block north side of the school, on Prince's Park West and in the elementary agriculture section of the school block. 
£362 was raised for the Special Prisoner of a War Appeal in 1942, June 25th, which was a state record back then. So again, people dug deep, helped out, supported those people in the need at the time. And the academic performance of the school was outstanding. It was almost with 50 students sitting in the qualifying exam and every child passing. So fantastic results, considering again illness, sickness, um, which contributed to that. 1945, where we bring them to, saw 371 students in the role. So we've seen an increasing enrolment of kids across there, um, due to obviously the reputation that was gained in the local community. August 15th, VJ Day, staff and children celebrated with the bell ringing, drums and whistles, and anything else that would act as a safety valve for pent up feelings. Students in the column four deep marched through the streets. So a historic day for the town and for the world at that time. And obviously the school wanted to be part of those celebrations with that. So this is a uh, grade L1 class in 1958, I believe, the one on the right hand side there. Um, unfortunately, very hard to read um, the pictures there. Again, looking at the class size numbers there, um, historically very big. Um, we only just had a school photos done in the end of last term, and to have every kid sitting there in uniform would be a miracle back then. I'm oh, sorry, now, back then, obviously there was that pride and presentation, still with that pride and presentation, but as I talk a bit later, the community has changed in terms of disadvantage and social need. I believe that photo there where they would have been taken would be between the old heritage building and the new admin building, just between there. So obviously that now is covered by a roof there. Um, a, a shaded roof there and joins on to the new 21st century building there. By 1948, the enrolments had hit 399. Um, and in September of that year, the teacher, head teacher began the house system for the school with four houses named historically Martin, Stewart, McKinley and Reed. Sturt. Sturt, sorry. And the Hutchins Cup, which I have right here, this is the original, the PC Hutchins Shield here, which was awarded to houses for inter-sport competitions on those days, and is still being presented each year at our sports day. So this one goes up to 1983. Um, however, we've still got an ongoing one in our front office there, which has House and Pride next to this year as well. So um, those names are very personal with our kids. We talked about them, they educated about them, they come through the school, about the meaning of them for our community as well and taken very much noticeable to ensure that they know the history and understanding for that. By 1950, the original school grounds were expanded to include the area between the old school building and Parnell Street. Um, this area had been set aside in the original 1839 William Light plan for Gawler Town as Parnell Square. Again, the enrolments keep increasing. We're now up to 497 students. And with those increases, as you would probably expect, there were shortages of rooms, uh, resulting in teachers having to teach at the RSL Hall. So that was in 1951, and we recall the spell for anyone. So desperate measures for desperate times. So luckily a community um, were able to use facilities for that to occur there. By, 19, by the November the 8th, 1951, they were able to return and they occupied the new portable rooms that were constructed at the school there. Then a massive jump in the, um, as the 50s continued, which saw 574 students on the enrolment books. So again, numbers of the school are increasing, people are getting that message out of the community, what's occurring there. Um, and being a government school, there was no one that could be you know, turned away from a government school. We all had to be in um, inclusive, and that certainly was allowing um, you know, students to have an education for those families um, in the town and for surrounds as well. The coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was celebrated at Gawler Primary School on June the 1st with the planting of four Indian cedar trees and four flowering gums planted in honour of the royal family in Parnell Square. September the 15th, sadly, the flag was at half mast due to the more untimely death of Miss Agatha Heinrich, a tireless worker for the school who had been actually started at the Welfare Club since the inception seven years beforehand. So, a person who worked tirelessly for the school community. Um, yeah, had, had such an impact on family, students and staff throughout her time there and was sadly missed once of her passing. In 
1959, the primary school opened with an attendance of 549, an increase of 57 from the previous year. Large enrolments forced the school to continue to occupy the Congregational Hall, and Mr. B. Walters, so in 1959, was appointed the first deputy headmaster. And the name rings a bell to anyone? So, for a school obviously that size, because in schools today, um, depending on your size and enrolment, you're entitled to a deputy principal, senior leader. Um, in a school of 549 today, you might have a deputy principal and two senior leaders supporting the principal. So back then, the headmaster was the one and only leadership team um, in charge of over 540 kids. is a massive responsibility, but fortunately, funding and needs of schools has changed and schools of that size are much more catered for in terms of leadership density. Amazingly, in the 1960s when we began, there was 1,100 pounds in cash at the school. So that doesn't sound like a lot by comparison, but actually that was raised through fundraising efforts, stalls, sales, and again the community spirit coming forward um, to support the school in time for that. It also saw tenders closing for the construction of the new, the new school at Evanston. So while Gula was going up and up and up in enrolments, the opening of Evanston out there was hoping to take the pressure off Gula Primary School, um, as there were 582 students enrolled. It was predicted, though, that the Evanston School would see Gula Primary School lose at least 200 students, so almost half in that time. And unfortunately, enrolments did decline further in 1964 when Gula East Primary School was open. So those massive boom days, and it did get up to 700 at one stage, slowly saw a decline due to the opening up of more public schools around town um, and people having greater choice. Um, today, Gawler Primary School is a zoned school, and it's been zoned for many years. Gawler Reese is a zoned school, so those schools have capacity issues, that's why they're zoned. But back then, anyone could choose a school to attend to um, at any time. There was a reading laboratory that commenced in grade five and six in 1966, and that was obviously seeing the focus continuing on with reading and making sure there was a focus for all kids and coming out having the basic um, needs and to be able to function and be successful in whatever they want to take upon in their lives. There was a funny moment where I came upon that Gula Primary Schools also had a great history of assisting with missing animals in the local community. I actually found a missing cat, which was air freighted back to Western Australia. And the principal at the time, Mr. Creve, um, received um, f four letters of thanks, and got given a lottery ticket, a dollar note, and an article in the Sydney Morning Herald for his generosity of making sure this cat got back to its rightful owners. Um, we also saw the appointment of a school librarian, Mr. C. Fiddock, in 1970s. Up until then, there hadn't been a librarian appointed into the school. So basically, whatever library resources were there were managed by the staff or by students. And obviously, a school librarian over time became a very historic and important role in, in schools. And the librarian today, we have, I don't have a librarian as such, we have a school service officer which maintains our library, because obviously the library role has changed and evolved over time, but it took until 1970 for actually a school librarian um, to be appointed there. Mr. J. Herm retired in 1976, and I believe his final act, what do you think his final act was in terms of helping out the community? He was actually acting as Father Christmas as his <laughs> final act before he signed off there. So he was very much um, respected by the local community and Miss Bradley and made sure he did a wonderful job as Father Christmas. This picture here there is probably, as we're moving into the 1980s here, saw, I suppose, continued need of re-vegetating the school, enhancing the beauty of it and with the landscaping here. Um, in 1985, um, a Lynn Stewart from Malala helped select and supply plants and designed a, a area for a new entrance to the school there. Um, early in the day, we had Rob Ryman, Len Warren, Helen Donnelly, Barry Lewis, Anne Griffiths, Shirley Squires, and Steve King, Gordon Hill, visited classrooms to talk to children about their opinions on equipment for the new adventure playground. So again, the school, and 
Adrian Shakti, um, who has had long involvement with the school, has also supported us to continue enhancing the vegetation, the plant, um, making sure wildlife is there. Um, I think he was part of the group many years ago that established the creek through there as well with all the reeds and underwater tank there. So when we did some work there a couple of years ago, Adrian was very much valuable to support us with that and then work um, through that to make sure we weren't going to bust any underwater tanks and cause many doubles of damage. So that event also there tied in with um, a fifty-five thousand dollar project. Now that doesn't sound that doesn't sound very big in those days, but fifty-five thousand back in, in, in 30, 40 years ago allowed a new administration block and some new classrooms. These were installed and renovated. And at that time, and even today with the new buildings and, and redevelopments there, storage was a massive issue. But these new um, resources allowed computers, arts, science, cooking and other equipment to be stored. And otherwise it was scattered across the school there. So you know, work health and safety wasn't a major issue back then, but certainly there was a need to make sure everything was put away. In the 90s, you know, when we were looking through some of the history of the school over time there, there was the introduction of a calculator course. And at the time, uh, then principal, Mr. the late Mr. Jeff Kobeljik stated that um, students needed to develop appropriate ski boards to cope with ever-changing world. Um, but no doubt these will be obsolete soon due to more advanced electronic devices. So the school back then budgeted and purchased 30 calculators, so a class set. These would have been shared around from room to room, because obviously there wasn't enough money to buy calculators for every classroom. And certainly um, they were used to enhance learning for those kids at the time. It's just a story about the calculators there. Couldn't find the exact date for that, but I believe it was the late 80s, early 90s with the calculators starting there um, with our students there. But amazing, isn't it? The calculators were such a novel activity back then, and now we all use our mobile phones as a calculator, or the World Wide Game on Computers to do it. We can walk around with the calculator in our pockets at any time. As we moved in to the new millennium, we, we probably saw unfortunately a decline in enrolments in the school and, and that wasn't to do a reflection of the school wasn't seen in a good seat in the community. It was actually due to the number of other school options in the, the school and surrounding areas. And it was actually at one stage two two hundred and five students were enrolled um, just before the millennium started and they were predicting only nine reception students to come into the school. A far cry from the years when we had 40, 50 reception students coming in or even higher. So it really became an issue, and as you would, many of you would know, Kula Primary School doesn't have a feeder kindergarten, so we rely upon our children coming from a variety of different early learning centres around the township and outside of, of the town of Kula. And that has been an issue over time, but that has improved due to enhanced relationships with those local preschools, working with those staff and supporting them, but certainly, um, yeah, nine students to begin with the million was a, a, a concern for ongoing um, longevity of classrooms, teachers and staffing purposes. So as we're moving into the 21st century, while the school had the beautiful heritage building, a lot of the transportable buildings at that time were in need of major repair. They hadn't been looked at apart from some general maintenance for many, many years. And that was causing a, quite a concern with the school community at the time. Um, that in the 21st century, how can we have facilities like this for our kids and our staff to be working in, considering that we have a new schools being built around us. Hewitt Primary School had been built. Um, there had been enhancements and, and work at Gawler West Primary School. But Gawler had very much so maintained its um, design, landscape, layout and building structure due to um, numbers at the time. Okay, so this picture's up here, this is from the northern side of the school here, looking through there. That new administrational block, which houses eight classrooms, an admin area, staff room, etc., that was officially opened in 2005 by the then Premier Mike Ram, and that was seen as a world-class design there. It cost $3.74 million as part of a redevelopment um, for the school, so significant money there was... Um, put in there for the design and also for the landscaping of the of the play area there. 
and actually the floor and floor plan and architecture was initiated by the school community, so they had great input in terms of what they wanted from the students at the time, um, and it was seen as a leading um, innovation for other schools to take that design and work upon um, as more school, further school constructions was done in that time with the state government. 2009, another $2 million was done to create a courtyard down in the bottom, which we refer to as the bottom north yard of, of the school there. And behind there, there is the retaining wall through there. So that is a hard court surface. It has a basketball court there. It is used every day um, by classrooms. Obviously, students at recess and lunchtime are using it. Shed there is our sports shed, so it's a resource for our kids there as well. But again, a beautiful facility uh, for our students to use on. And also in that time there, as I mentioned before, the earlier photo was taken, the breezeway was constructed through there in a small covered outdoor learning area because um, from what my understanding was, if you stepped outside there, you almost got blown away in the winter times and they needed you know, an area for students, uh, for staff to either um, sit, at, sit at lunchtime or recess and also for just general health and well-being. One of the interesting things about the buildings and designs there is that while the new building um, was established and designed and took on, it didn't take away the beauty of the heritage building there. It was blended in so well, and when I have people come for visits or come for tours, I say to people, the school has, it's got the, it's got the blend of the new with the old. And not a lot of building designs you see where schools are reconstructed, redesigned, and how it takes away the heritage from there, they will never lose that with the design of our school there at the moment. It's just beautiful. And when I take tours on people, um, and show them through what's occurred in the redevelopment. They, they comment about it hasn't lost its spark or beauty, even with you know, significant money spent in there. It's actually quite interesting as, as we you know, move through the time of there. By 2014, the school was actually um, in a position where it needed to have a new OSH service provided. Now, I might be wrong here, but I remember, I think it was my second day of my appointment there, and I was standing in the town of all the council chambers pleading to the council members at the time to maintain the OSH run at the Gawler Sport and Recreation Centre because it was concerned due to cost and money being raised from that, it wasn't a viable service. And I was pleading my case to keep it over for six months, which they did, and I thank them for that, and then we went to a third party provider. So our OSH has been operating now for six years, and that is run out from the multi-purpose room in the Heritage Building, they utilise the canteen down there as, as for afternoon tea and for breakfast in the mornings. And the OSH has been a very much wanted um, service for our school community. We average 16 in the morning, close to 18 to 20 in the afternoons. And has a vacation care um, in, after, in the holidays as well, which is utilised by all students across the region. And we are very fortunate that um, the OSH was continuing to be able to get it going because we were going to lose students. And no school wants to lose students and the OSH has provided an opportunity um, to maintain enrolments and also um, support those working families. We were also in 2014, another year first in 2014, we became the first government dyslexia aware school, which went to receiving a quality mark from the dyslexia action group in, from Barossa and Gawler Surrounds. For those of you who don't know, dyslexia is a learning disorder characterised by difficulty reading and can occur in children with normal vision and intelligence. It's probably the most frustrating learning disorder you can have because you have that intelligence, you have the skill, but you're not able to tra um, transfer that across into your learning. There was a lot of work that went into this. Well, upon my arrival there, I wasn't part of all of it, so I'm not going to, and I won't take credit for it, but I know the staff had to go through a really rigorous process to prove why um, we needed to become a dyslexia aware a school that showed how they were differentiating work. And differentiating, if you're not aware of that, is how you're catering for individual student needs. And especially with dyslexic students, and there is also um, concern that, you know, not just dyslexia, dyslexia but dyslexia type learning needs, um, it meant how you're going to modify curriculum, learning support for kids to enable them to engage the curriculum, access that, and be successful in their learning. So that accreditation was a wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity to reflect on not just the care part of our bio staff, but the desire and skills they had to work for every student in their care. And that was very much um, recognised with a presentation 
LA, LA Convention Centre, um, articles, and media commitments, um, because we were that first government school to receive that. So I'd be very proud of that achievement. By 2018, the school was you know, 140 years old. And for many people, it's like, where is 140 years gone you know, for a school community? And as I mentioned earlier, Brian was one of our um, people who attended that 140th birthday. And that was a wonderful opportunity to meet people as a school principal at the time who had such fond, wonderful memories of the time there. Um, to look back, see how the school had changed, meet staff currently, connect with ex-staff members of the school. Um, a wonderful, wonderful turnout from people there. We had a 140th birthday cake, individual little cakes made by a parent, and we even had a fashion history night for the night, which went through each the decades, each 20 of the decades through the school there. Um, and the kids just got so much out of it. And then what they learned from how kids learned and dressed from the previous years as well, um, very much so was being talked about for a long time afterwards. With that 140th birthday, um, and now being 142 years old, we continue to go from strength to strength with our community involvement and the reputation in the school. Back in August 2019, we became what, the first school in our local portfolio, and the portfolio means schools in a learning um, area of the state, to be white ribbon accredited school. White ribbon accreditation was um, something we had been talking about for a number of years due to the changing complexities in the school community and making sure our students, particularly our boys, um, understood the need of how to treat women right and fairly and safely and respectfully to them. It was a challenge to begin with because we did have some resistance from some members, um, but through the determination of staff members, uh, persistence of staff members, um, educating of people, we've able been able to change some headsets and mindsets about how we need to behave in society. So that was very much uh, a great way of raising awareness and working with the local town as well um, to promote what the message out there. You may have noticed too, there's a lovely mural that's been constructed on that retaining wall down there, um, which was done by a local artist and that was involved, and kids actually had input to that design and actually painted it with her as well. So they had the hands-on opportunity to be um, part of that learning, but also um, have a lasting impact for us. And when you drive past, it's right in your face too as well as you see it. Um, we chose that particularly to get the message across for any community members through there um, because it's such an important cause. Uh, as part of that curriculum also, there was also um, lessons with the child protection curriculum um, and working across the particularly older students to be those role models for students coming through. Just going back to also just recently, more so the last 18 months, I've continued as principal and I had the luxury, remember when I first got appointed, my line manager at the time said to me, David, you're walking to the most beautiful schools in the state. You don't have any work to do in terms of enhancing it. And she was absolutely right. I've worked in schools before where you know, buildings are damaged, there's cracks, there's no air conditioning working properly, um, and schools in need of major repair. I haven't had to go around building new buildings or fixing up things because of the way the school is kept. But it has meant for me that I wanted to enhance the school. So. We spent probably close to over eighty thousand dollars recently in the last two years of upgrading our ICT. So there are smart TVs in every room. So ICT refers to information community technology. So using World Wide Web, using computers, laptops, and iPads, um, because our world we live in a digital world now with everything, and we need to make sure our students have those skills um, to continue their life journey as well. So smart TVs are in all classrooms. We have. A substantial laptop and iPad pool available for our kids. We've still got a dedicated computer pool, a computer room which has had updated and upgraded PCs in there um, to ensure that you know, no student, you know, we can have enough for every classroom for that. And we've also seen painting read under the school. So while the administration building is relatively young, um, I wanted to improve the painting inside because at times I thought it reminded me of um, baby vomit on some of the walls because of the colour they chose back 15 years ago. So we now have a nice um, colour through the administration building, all classroom buildings were painted as well. The library ceiling was repainted. Unfortunately, it had been touched for over 50 years. Um, so flaking paint isn't a good sign for any prospective parents coming in. So that has all been improved. And in the south yard of the school, um, uh, with that, 
The South Yard is one of those areas which is highly populated by our students uh, at recess and lunchtime. But unfortunately, we had an area of land here in the South Yard which became like a bit of a dirt pit because grass was not growing. I wasn't prepared to spend thousands and thousands of dollars every year with water there. So we built a nature play area there. We received the $15,000 grant as part of the um, Fund My Neighbourhood grant back um, three years ago. And then more recently, um, in the last year, we committed 40000 of school funds to make the second stage of that land um, into a nature play there. So if you are driving along Nixon Terrace, please stop and have a look at the nature play there because um, while every school may have a nature play area, um, I think it's important to you know, enhance your schools. Um, they can range from you know, a few thousand dollars through to $200,000. Um, I think it's a big balance to try and get it right there, but certainly it's, a, it's enhanced that area there for our kids um, to use. And also use as a science area too, uh, for classrooms to be learning outside um, as the need arises. So as we continue to move along um, in the history of the school year, um, 2020 we're in a pretty strong, great position I would say. Currently have just over 190 students from our school. And again, as I mentioned earlier, 190 students around the 200 mark is fantastic considering how many other schools are in the local area which parents, carers can choose from. And I think um, we will see a little dip in that enrolment in the next two years as we see year six and seven move to high school at the end of next year. So that will see the school drop, but we'll still have, uh, I think, healthy numbers and all schools will be impacted by the year six, seven move. But my um, argument has always been you need to have a school which is performing well, you need to have a school which is um, appealing to people as well, and when they come to visit, you want people to go, I want my children at the school here. So I'm sure with um, academic results continuing to improve, maintaining growth for every student, and ensuring that parents are sending the schools to a safe environment, we, um, we will continue to maintain our enrolments in the years to come there. We've got eight classes in the main building, so in that main building administration slash classroom area there, all eight classrooms are being used this year. We'll probably see maybe seven classrooms next year, but certainly eight classrooms have been used for the last six years, which is fantastic. Uh, classes range from 23 to our biggest class of just on 30. So again, our numbers are very different from the heyday when we had 121 students in one class. We've got 11.6 total teaching staff, and that includes um, leadership as well. There are a total of 11 SSOs employed, which includes administration, finance, curriculum, and grounds. I have struck gold with our grounds person. Our groundsman, Brian Thomason, is incredible. Um, he often talks about he does one job on a Monday, and then on Wednesday he finds another area of the school to find because of the design of the school is so unique in the layout. Um, he's forever keeping it um, beautified. So, um, we have a, yeah, a beautiful grounds kept by Brian, and we're very grateful for his work there. We provide all le eight learning areas of the curriculum um, for there, and our specialist instruction um, for our teachers, because our teachers are entitled to what's called non-instruction time, which, and we provide that in science and Japanese for them. Science, sorry, science, Japanese, STEM, and some PE. With the families today, we, we have seen a change of, of students coming from a broader range of cultural and financial backgrounds. The school, each school is given a level of category of disadvantage. So a, a school with a category of disadvantage of one means that is the most lowest disadvantaged school you can have, three to a seven, which means it's a very affluent school. So Gawler Primary School was classed for many years as a category five school. And probably about three years before I arrived, you got changed from a five to a three. And that was significant because usually schools go up in their, dis in their level, they don't go down. And that was a reflection of how the school community had changed with disadvantage. And we still remain a three at the moment. Um, however, while we've had more dual income families come in, um, in into our school here, there is still obviously the um, level of um, support needed in our, in our school community for those students. Educational employment of families obviously varies greatly. Um, we have you know, the tertiary qualified people, working people working in trades, um, a significant number of families who still have um, struggled through a significant disadvantage. I mentioned before about we don't have a feeder kindergarten, which obviously in the past has made it difficult to ascertain how many kids we're going to have coming in for a reception each year um, and what we need to be planning for. Um, however, our students come from not just preschools and local kindergartens across our, our, our town of Gula here, 
but northern suburbs. We even had some families who wanted to come from the northeastern suburbs of, of Adelaide, and we have enrolments quite often coming from over the country um, who want to relocate back in here. And being a zone school, they have to be living in our zone um, at the time for that. And if we have classes which are at capacity high, um, if a student comes into our zone and we've got, say, more than a required number in the classroom, we need to take that student. And we have no choice if, it's, if they're living in our zone. However, if students are outside of our zone, we don't have to take them. But if we do have space, I generally want them to make sure we take those families and to support them, if, especially if they've chosen our school. Um, as their child's education for the years to come there. Um, so yeah, transition for the school is very important um, for that. And we try and do our transition visits in um, term four of each school year. Uh, year seven is completing. They go to a range of Department for Education schools, Catholic schools and independence um, secondary schools. We even have some of our school, um, year sevens go to Kapunda High School, New to High School. Uh, predominantly, a lot of them have uh, made the move to Xavier as well, especially with the Year 7 move a couple of years ago, Xavier opened up. We did see a number of our Year 6s leave um, their cohort and went to Xavier. Now, as a principal, I, I respect everyone's right to attend the school of their choice, um, but I know that um, you know, when um, you lose quality families and kids um, and they go off to another school and that school can take proud um, result of the wonderful academic results they have, you feel like you miss out on that in the celebrations because of all the work that you've done to help those students throughout. But again, um, that's a reflection of um, the schools and the choice that parents have available to them. Volunteering has always been a standard of our school community, right through, as I mentioned, the war days of, of supporting families, um, of the welfare of, of people in need at the time. Um, we have activities and unfortunately COVID, like everything in our lives, has affected that but we have had over a number of years and before my time, a dedicated group of parents who, if you ask for something to be done, they will do it at the click of a finger. And I've always said that as a principle, it is your parents who make your school, um, because if they, they're supporting you and volunteering their time, you need to be extremely grateful for it because they don't have to do that. And if you've got lots of people doing it, that tells you that those people are welcome and they feel invited into school here. So things such as breakfast clubs, special food days, working with students um, for reading, supporting classrooms, attending camps, doing things like that, I'm forever grateful for. And we have, as most government schools here, we have a Volunteer of the Year Award, which we award at the end of each year to recognise, um, which is voted for by our staff, for that volunteer who's done outstanding service um, to the school year. In terms of how, a school, how we finance each, um, these days, we have um, what's called a resource entitlement statement. So each school is given what's called money coming in, which you need to spend to um, structure your classrooms, how much teachers you will have, your leadership structure, um, curriculum maintenance, learning plans, uh, money for any breakdown jobs you have, such as the toilet's not flushing, or you can't turn the light switch on, etc. So we have coming in over the course of the year, but it's done into months, well over $2 million comes in as part of funding. And I call it the funding, is called, um, you need bums on seats. So every kid that comes in brings a dollar figure. And, then, and the more kids you have coming in, which means more money you can, you can spend and use um, and, and spend on programs for students. And I've been always very big on that. Every cent that comes in, we need to show how it's being spent to improve outcomes for kids um, and be used um, and sensibly. And I've always made sure um, being in a financial position is very important um, for that. As I mentioned before, we are, the annual sports day is still a, a significant importance to our school. We have that on the Princess Park, it's held each year. We've moved across the year from Term 1 to Term 4. Unfortunately, every year, I think since I've been here, it's been either a modified program due to heat or thunderstorms, so we haven't really had one. And this year, we missed out doing it in Term 1, but we hope to reschedule that in for Term 4. And as I mentioned, um, with the house, um, cap, um, house um, shield there we've awarded to, um, the students take great pride in being leaders of their houses, supporting their kids. Um, great parent turnout. We have our bake stalls. We have our um, way of raising funds for our year sevens for the end of year um, graduation. We also have time, to, and we always have divvy money back into each classroom as well um, to support their um, learning needs. We also talk about annual acquaintance evening, which is important for our families. Year seven aquatics camp, which I mentioned. Year primary years camp. We have a book fair. We also um, have a science week. We've introduced. A couple of years ago now, a biannual cultural um, day, because Japanese is our load subject, has become very much embedded in our school community. 
um, and, when, and it's extremely valued um, by our students and their families. End of year concert, unfortunately we couldn't have any year concert because it's actually hosted over the recreation centre and last year they were redoing all their floor. So we missed out having our concert last year and who knows where opening is going this year. We may miss out again having our end of year concert because um, they have a friend called COVID. Um, so I think as, as we're you know, summing up and finishing off there, I think for a school which had you know, very you know, origins coming back as being the first model school through to where it's standing now, the community mind focus, the inclusivity that our teachers have and for our families and for those students, and we have had students over the time come through with high needs, learning needs, behavioural needs, and those kids have always been very much included in any aspect of the school curriculum. And I think it's a, a reflection of um, the school, how it's seen when I get enrolment inquiries from all over the state saying that they're prepared to move their kids into school or so they can get into our school here because of what they hear about our school here. So as I look back over seven years of the school here, the privilege I have had and continue to see it grow and evolve, I think the next 142 years look very exciting for it. So I hope that's given you a good insight to the school. Um, if there's anything you'd like to question me on about, please do so, because I'm sure if there's something that I've got wrong or mistaken, but it's been a privilege to come and talk to you about the school. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'll start the questions yes. off. Um, bullying in schools, is that something that teachers are um, made truly aware of to look out for and, and you know, is, is it a major problem? Bullying is one of those questions which obviously pops up a lot um, in a school environment with parents or with students. Um, certainly, I say to people when they come to school, I can't guarantee they won't be bullying. However, in today's um, education system, in the world of social media, which obviously can happen 24-7, so the days of something happening in the schoolyard and it being done and then going home, it can now continue on out there. We make it a very... Um, important aspect that uh, us, all, all our staff, from leadership down, you know, teachers, SSOs, um, people in our school here, that we want to be supporting those families, uh, supporting those students, and that we uh, need to educate our kids about what bullying actually is. Because I think, unfortunately, in many parts of today's society, if someone makes one comment, they think it's bullying. And we know that bullying is ongoing, repeated behaviour, which can have an impact on students, adults in our lives here. But, we, um, as part of a trial in the Greater Gawler Partnership, we do in the Friendly Schools Program, which is from the Western Australia model, and that's about enhancing schools, making them safe, and teaching kids how to self-regulate, uh, monitor their behaviour, um, understand the trauma background the kids come from, but certainly bullying um, is a paramount for our things. We have to have policies and procedures to deal with it um, when it does rear its ugly head. Thank you. Questions? Other questions? Wait a minute, just a second. I'd just like to say that I was very privileged to cap the 140th birthday cake. You certainly were. Yeah. It was a wonderful night, wasn't it? It was great to have your, yeah, your attendance there for that, and I hope you enjoyed the cake as well. I can remember from 1950 to 56 when I was there, there was no heating and no cooling. <laughs> and uh, you're in those transporters. and the, Oh, there was a wood fire, yeah. Um, in years four to seven, we were down in the, where the uh, basketball and, the, and was, they were just transportables. And oh, they got hot and they got cold. <laughs> Margaret. I'd just like to add to the story. Can everyone hear me? Um, from 1948, there was a migrant hostel in uh, Williston, uh, and uh, the numbers of children going to school increased vastly. That was. Um, I'd just like to uh, add to what uh, Margaret said. Um, yeah, back in, from 50s onwards, we had uh, the influx of not only the Williston Hotel, but we had the Smithwood Hostel. 
the Smithfield School at that time had an influx of people there and they had to turn them away to send them off to Gawler. And so there was a, a large number of kids going to not only come to school but it enhanced the popularity of people living in Gawler from those kids that were coming from the school. So very, very turbulent times and we were lucky enough to be part of that. That's a good question to be asking there, in, in that um, relate, because that's a reflection of how the education um, system has changed in time in terms of priorities with literacy. Um, I went through an era where I still learned how to do things script, um, and my cursory writing, I look back with quite proud, considering how messy it is right now, because we do everything on email and phone, um, but certainly that's a reflection of how the, the teaching methodologies have changed, um, the amount of online learning we are doing. And even our NAPLAN tests, which were done on you know, pencil and paper for many years, are now done online. So the opportunity to practice you know, handwriting um, for that part of my year three, so you still do it um, in paper form, is all online now. So unfortunately, that's a reflection of how the world's moved along. I still value um, you know, the ability to be able to write you know, neatly, um, do things script. Um, and sadly, yeah, it's not a common occurrence in schools today um, for that, due to the change in evolving curriculum and the IT world we're living in. Can I just follow up? What would you <coughs> say would be the, <coughs> excuse me, the major disadvantage of not having to Major disadvantage of having to curse. Well, I always saw that having that it was, a, it was a quicker way of handwriting, so it was a quicker way of producing your work um, for that. Um, legibility as well um, with, with cursive. Um, but I couldn't see like it would be um, in t today probably because, again, as I was referring to before, we do so much stuff online now. Um, myself, is a, in the last probably five years, I don't think I've ever sent so many emails in my life because the amount of written notes I do has, has reduced dramatically because of our world we're working in and communication to get things instantaneously to other people. Um, but certainly, yeah, having cursive writing, um, I think, is a skill to have because the ability to write quicker. Um, it's also a, a pride thing as well to show um, how you can do things, but the opportunities to do that have probably reduced dramatically due to the changing curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. David, David uh, my two children went to Gawler Primary in the late 70s, and I had the privilege of being the coach of the, at the primary school late 70s, and we went top a couple of times. And I can still remember all them lads. It's probably a highlight of my life. And one of the mums are here tonight, young Richard Hine, was one of our stars. We, we had about four or five lads that were absolutely brilliant. And we built up a terrific bond, and I still see a few of them around the town. And it uh, gives me a great thrill. And thank you. No, I bet it would be because yeah, to, to have achieved that and enjoy their success back then and, and still see those people today and see them growing up. And, and, the people they've become it would be absolutely highlight obviously to do that. So no, again in the amount of people I've met with their memories and connections to the school has been incredible. So thank you for sharing that. Have you heard of the Dr. George Medal? Yes. That was given out. Yes we have. Um, that is um, a private place of, of the school. There isn't given out any uh, more as, as time has evolved and changed, but certainly has played a you know, crucial part of the school history over time it has. Yeah. Just hold for one second. Seven seconds. <laughs> Okay. Um, did you have any high IQ students? Do do we have so now you now or in the past? In the past. 
I haven't examined the school records probably to that length to know how, how high some um, students achieved, but certainly um, talking to people who had gone, who had gone through there, there had been many high achieving students that have gone to tertiary study, um, works of field, um, which probably didn't always occur in every other government school at the time there. And certainly, um, if I talk about, you know, just recently about some of those students have gone to other schools in our partnership, that is high school, high school independent schools, those students have become high performing students with their year 12 results, which has been a reflection of that. But yeah, in terms of the highest performing student, I couldn't answer that right now, but it's certainly something I'm not happy to look into with the records at the school there, yeah. I'm actually a retired teacher and uh, taught in TAFE and I found that there were quite a few high achievers who, that had not been recognised in the primary school level. And it's, and it's a shame you know, that that's how it's occurred. Huh? Yeah, because we do still at the end of each school year we have our Ducks Award we're giving out for the highest performing students and that, and it's based on a set of criteria. Um, it's discussed by the Year 7 teachers and our specialist teachers, um, and certainly that is uh, given out to who, the student that's most deserving of that, uh, for a male and a female, and I know the recipients of that have been quite proud um, to, you know, to be acknowledged in that way, but certainly I agree that people have missed out, and that is a shame, um, because we need to recognise academic performance. Um, and enrich our students to make sure that, you know, high achieving is, is a great thing to be doing. Uh, I went there from 48 to 54. A few memories come back. Uh, there was the girls' yard where they played and the boys' yard where we played. Yes, they had a separation, didn't they? There a separation between the, there and uh, in the corner of the headmaster's office there was a cane. Yeah, I don't have one of them in my office anymore. Uh, it was regularly bought out, of it? Uh, sometimes on the hand and sometimes on the butt, but uh, it, it had its effect. Uh, so, yeah, great days we were there. We played marbles at the recess time, and or cricket, and the girls played vigoro and uh, basketball in those days. And did the maypole dance, all those sort of things were done uh, while we were there. We saluted the flag. Yeah, we saluted the flag every, every Tuesday morning with religious instruction. And, uh, they so marched the flag and marked off the religious instruction. So there you are. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? If you want to punish <coughs> students today, you take away their telephone. <laughs> <laughs> our, our students kindly, when they come into school, will hand their mobile phone in every day at the front office. So I'm very fortunate I'm dealing with kids on phones in their classroom. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> okay, that's the questions. I'll now ask Helen Hennessy to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. And just one second, please. I've got to swing over both of you in. Okay. Um, David, I'm big, Helen Hennessy. Um, my children went to school between 1995 and 2005. Um, I have the privilege of being the chair of the Parents Association, I think we called it. Um, and so we started the process of um, building a new school. It's a shame. You did a very good job. No, um, it's a shame Adrian's not here because Adrian was on the committee as well. And in fact, when I handed over, he went, he, he took it up. Um, uh, get closer together. It's COVID. No, I, I just did the right thing. <laughs> um, on that committee was also Karen Redmond, so it's a pretty impressive parents' committee. Yes. Yeah, so, um, it's great to hear that it's still going ahead. It was very much a community driven. I remember looking at the plans with Ian Langley and going, this is going to work, this isn't going to work, so I'm glad to know. I did learn something today though. Um, a colleague of mine, Colin Fider, that the fact that he was the first librarian there probably explains why you've got so much history because he was particularly good at collecting history. So thank you very much for your so, um, talk. I'm sure we've all learned something. It's a very important part of the of the town for primary school. The reason we chose it is that it was a small, diverse school, um, beautiful, beautiful location, part of a caring community, and it treasures its history. So for our family, who, um, thinking to your question of high achievers, the children that went through with my two children have gone on, I can think, there's lawyers, there's research scientists, there's some medical people in there as well, so there have been good people, there have been kids that have done well, 
But I understand your point. There are often children at primary school who don't get recognised, who, and that is such a shame. Um, so, anyway, on behalf of the group, I'd like to thank you very much for speaking to us tonight and giving us the history so they can continue. And I'm told that behind here, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, look. oh, look. There you go, Dave. Thank you very, very much on behalf of the group. Thank you very much.